He said to my church, you're sitting idly by, waiting on the other shoe to drop, when in fact it already hit the floor. The flood waters of dangerous days has already reached your doors, and many, listen to this, are waiting on rescue. But I tell you this day, there will be no rescue from the terrible times that are here. You're in them now, and you are the ones that I've appointed to be the rescuers of the drowning in their own folly in sin. Why does my church desire so much to escape when I need her the most? This will not be an evacuation from these days, but the precise execution of my will in ways. I have saved the best for the last days. You are preserved to persevere. Don't give up now and never give in. The final harvest is in the final tribulation. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to speak your word today. I ask for you to hide me behind the shadow of the cross that no man remember my name, nor the name of this church, but remember the name that's above every single name, that at that name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do, and that's convince and convict men and bring them into a saving relationship of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody, everywhere, said amen. I desire for you, when you have the opportunity to re-listen or re-read those words, they're very powerful, and I think just consuming it one time, you don't get the totality of what the Lord is saying. But I will set up this message by telling you that there are many in the church today who are looking at the times that we're living in and not understanding them in totality because they have been taught by their preachers and their Sunday school teachers of the past that everything's going to be rosy and that we're going to fly, fly away, little birdie, and that there'll be no trials and tribulations and testings and hard times in our lives because we are Christians. Liar, liar, your pants are on fire. The reality is that it gets harder and harder as we go into the final days of humanity. And we're watching page after page of not only the word being revealed, but life in general of the totality of where we really are. And how many of y'all know we haven't been evacuated yet? Uh, I haven't left this planet. And as far as I know, I'm still here And so are you, though my prophecy teachers of the past and though I preached it myself, we'd be gone long before all the trouble began. How many of y'all know that's wrong? It's wrong theology. Now, I'm not going to go out and fight anybody in the parking lot today over this message of eschatology, the study of end times and when and how and uh, all these things of leaving here. All I know, and I've taught on it plenty, but all I know is you better buckle up and hang on, Susie Q, because we got a ride to ride, and God needs us in this hour. He don't need you checking out mentally and checking out spiritually, because you're sure not going to check out physically until it's time. Is anybody here today, and God is in need of you, and God is in need of me, and God is in need of this church to do his will precisely the execution of his plans of the last days. But many in the church today want to float and get on out of here and, and to excuse themselves from the responsibility of God. But my question to you, my friend, is who will do the work of God if you're not here? Physically, mentally, or spiritually, you can't trust the government to do it. You can't, come on, somebody, you can't trust some of these mega churches and mega pastors to do it. You better have some boots on the ground and some frontline fighters who are willing to fight the good fight of faith or not afraid of the fires of the trials of tribulation and willing to put their hands on the plow. I can't find nobody to help me this morning. In this petrified, I mean, Pentecostal church. And, 
And so the beginning of this message is, is, is a warning to the body of Christ that, number one, you're not going nowhere. I, I, I wished, I said wished, and I preached, and I taught that you would, but that isn't so back in the day. Come on, somebody, it's time for a reality check. And so as I was praying, the Lord gave me this word, and the title of the message is called Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse Now. I'm not talking about the movie from 1979, the epic movie movie of war, and some of you all may remember. I'm not talking about that with Martin Sheen, and on and on it goes. And I'm not even talking theologically about end times as in tribulation period. So let me... Set you straight for my critics that will write to me in Magic Marker. Listen to me. I'm not talking that we are in tribulation as in that period, but we are in the times of trouble. We are in the times of the birthing of trouble. We're in the time of sorrows. And we're in a time not to get out, but to be equipped. It's time for us to see the strategy of God and the war plans, if you will, of what God is going to do in and through the church and to prepare ourselves and to go into basic training. Come on, somebody, to get your bayonet ready, to get your spiritual armor on and get into the war that's in front of us. And the war I'm talking about is not with bombs and bullets and missiles. I'm talking about the war of the spirit of the war of endurance so many folks today are falling and falling back and failing and failing in their walk with God because they they want to know where the coming of the Lord is and where is this great escape and where are all these promises that were promised to us by our preachers I'm here to tell you those are fables and those are nothing but wish so's the reality is we're going to be on the ground for a while. Look at your neighbor. We're, going, we're ground troops. We're going to be here for a while. We got some duty to do. We got some work to do. We got some fighting to do. And I'm going to tell you something. You can't be fighting on earth while you just you know, got your head up in the clouds and wondering if this is the day. No, honey, this is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it, but this is the day I'm going to battle. Because every day is a battle. I said every day is a battle. It's a battle to get out of bed. I said it's a battle to read your Bible. It's a battle to pray. It's a battle to evangelize. Come on now. And we got to learn how to be tough in the power of God. We need to have some, some drill sergeants preaching to us. Come on, Miss Mary. Sergeant Mary. Apocalypse now. Again, you say that and, and people, uh, they say, well, yeah, that's coming someday. No, honey, we're living in it now. Apocalypse is talking about trials. It's talking about dangerous times. It's not just talking about a time period of tribulation. Again, I, I'm not getting into the eschatology of it all. I'm getting into the reality of it all that we're living in dangerous days. We're living in times that are hard. We're living in times that are, that are scary, if you will, if you don't know the word. But how many of y'all know we know the word? We know what time it is. We know what's going on. And we're not afraid. We've got the steadiest hand in the room. Come on, somebody. Without worried about what's going on. Well, don't you know the stock market's going down? So they'll go broke. I'll go blessed. Come on, baby. I'm not worried about what's happening. Don't you know what's happening in Ukraine? Don't you know what's happening over here? Don't you know what's happening? I know everything that's happening the best as I possibly can, but I read the book. The book says I win. The book says we're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, blessed coming in and going out in the city and the field. If God be for me, who could ever be against me? Whoo, glory to God. If God is with you, you can set up a pup tent right on the corner of hell. And God will supply all your needs according to the riches and glory that are in Christ Jesus. Are you there? All right. Apocalypse now. I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. This is a very powerful chapter that is so profoundly prophetic for this hour. 
Isaiah chapter 5. Again, if you came for cookies and punch and a little puppet show, you've came to the wrong church today. I've got an assignment. I said, I've got an assignment, and that is to release this prophetic word to the nations of the earth. You already told me you love me, so quit getting nervous. Isaiah chapter 5. Are you there yet? I want to preface this by telling you that Isaiah was singing a prophetic song. He was given a prophetic song by God, and it was 150 years prior to the invasion of Babylon. Now, I put that in there not for to make myself look like I'm so smart historically, even though I'm historical, I'm not that smart. Come on, somebody. You'll catch that later. But the prophecy and the song thereof was 150 years before the destruction came. And see, in America and the world, really, when we hear prophetic things and they don't come to pass like right at noon, We don't think it's going to happen at all. See, judgment delayed is not judgment denied. There's a court date someday. I said there's a day to be sentenced someday. And because we live in American bubble and dream, because believe me, most of the world doesn't think this way, but America has a very special Bible. We have a synthetic Bible. We have a fantasy island Bible. We have a Bible written by Disney. And it's a happy, happy fairy tale ending. Come on now. But in reality is that's not how the book is read. The book is read that many are the afflictions of the righteous. Trials and tribulations are going to come your way. He that endures to the end uh, shall be saved. Not he that slides in and thinks everything's going to be fine. He that endures. There's a doctrine of endurance we don't talk about anymore because we believe in our church, especially in the Bible belt like this area, the buckle, we think that we are preserved from things. I'm preserved from hell because I gave my name, my life, and my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm preserved from those things, but I'm not prevented from going through hell. Listen to me now. Being born again doesn't mean I'm going to have wonderful days and singing a tune at noon because everything's clear and sunny and wonderful and everything's just going my way and paychecks are flying in and come on now. Got Bentleys parked out front and King Ranchers and whatever else you may own and all these things. That isn't a guaranteed life of a believer. The guaranteed life of a believer is to fight the good fight of faith. That the enemy will come and do what? Try to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life, life more abundantly. That doesn't mean there's absence of war. See, people in America, they want peace. I just need peace, Pastor. I I just, when I go to your services, I just need peace afterwards. Let me tell you something. You can't have peace without war. You don't know what peace is until you have war. And he says, I give you that peace that passes all understanding. I don't understand why I'm the happiest man in this room today when I don't have everything like you do. You got it all together. I don't have it all together. I'm working on it. You just call me Mr. Duct Tape. Is anybody here? I'm just doing all I can. Lord, hold me together. Keep me together. I'm I'm trying to live this life. I'm trying to do it the right way. Some of y'all were born with a halo on your head. Some of your halos are crooked on your horns this morning. We're going to help straighten that thing out this day. Are you an Isaiah? I didn't, I just want to make sure you knew where it was at. So Isaiah chapter 5 is a prophecy 150 years ago before this took place. 
And again, in the American mindset is we go through administration after administration. We go through decade after decade. We go through war after war and trial after trial. And we think the coming of the Lord is not going to happen. We think we're not going to be a part of the last days. Again, because we've been taught the false doctrine, the wrong doctrine, that we're out of here. Have I gotten you mad yet? I'm really working hard at it. Because once I get you mad, I'm going to get you happy. Let's look at Isaiah. I'll, I'll just go ahead and preach this thing, and you can, you can argue with the word. You and, you and the Bible just argue. I'd like to see people just take the Bible and argue with it. Verse 1. How dumb is that? Verse 1, now I will sing to my well-beloved. Now, I want you to see this here before you think, oh, it's just doom and gloom preaching. He's just trying to be bad. He said, I'm singing my song to my well-beloved. See, God loves us. God loves us. He's got a plan for us, but he never promised us a rose garden. And if you get a rose, you get a what? A thorn. See, Mr. Preacher Happy Man, he wants to give you all roses. Well, I'm going to give you reality, and with roses comes thorns. Don't make me sing this song, because you know I will. Now, I will use, watch this, I will sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. So he's going into a prophecy here. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and in a very fruitful hill. So he begins by being descriptive. And I want you to see the parallel between Israel, Judah, if you will, Jerusalem, the Israelites, if you will, the Jewish people, and America, because this is prophetic. Watch what he says here. And he fenced it. And he gathered out the stones thereof, and he planted it with the choicest vine. And he did what? He built a tower in the midst of it, and he also made a wine press therein, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes. Let's stop right there. So he says, listen, I've built this place. I designed this place. I created a place that was like no other place, no other nation, no other people. Again, we're talking historically about Judah, but prophetically he's talking to America. I have put you as a city upon a hill. I've put you above nations. There's been no other nation like America that has been produced greater assets of humanity than America. Whether it's through inventions or whether it's through financial markets and measurements and all the things that we use for, for the economies of the world, none has been like America. There has been none like our military over the decades. Even though we have faltered and failed and been bruised and battered, we have still been a strong force across the nations of the earth. We've held back dictators and tyrants and all kinds of craziness and evil, evil in the world, have we not? There's no doubt about it. And now flipping it over to the reality of the church, there's been nothing like the American church. When the nations of the world look at the American church with the lights and the cameras and all of the beautiful things that we have, they lust in their hearts for the things that we possess today. I know this. I've been to the nations of the world, and they admire us, not in our doctrines of thievery and covetedness and false prosperity, but they desire the plentiness of these things because they know what they would do with what we have. Our problem is we don't know what to do with what we have because what we have has us. Is anybody in this house today, and therefore the church has become weighted down by prosperity and has been polluted by these things when it wasn't meant to be that way? And so God looks across the landscape of America, and he sees sees the big churches and the big steeples and the big peoples. Come on. Come on, somebody that's inside the house of God. And he says, I've given you everything you need to succeed. 
There is no reason in my mind why this church, the Church of America, should not be flipping the world upside down and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the four flung quarters of the earth. There's no reason. Here in America today, we spend more money on dog food than we do world missions. It's a shame. Less than 1% of world missions is focused upon the 1040 window of the world. Less than 1% go to places such as India, the places where nobody has heard the name of Christ yet. Yet we're wanting to get out of here. Let's travel. Let's go. Let's rapture. Is anybody with me? Who's going to evangelize them? Who's going to preach this blessed message? You are. I'm glad you asked. You are. And I am. But he looked across this landscape. He said, man, I gave you all this stuff. I even put a tower in the middle. What's he talking about? He is your high tower, isn't he? I said, he is your high tower. What do you need a tower for? To look over your enemies. Watch out. How many of y'all know if you're higher up, you can see further. You can see better. And God said, I was your tower in the midst of your land. I blessed you. Again, America was a place of the fruited plains, a place of great liberty and great uh, prosperity and blessings, but it's become a hellhole. I'm going to say it if you don't like it. It's become a hellhole. The Bible declares that any nation that forgets God will be turned into hell, and we have forgotten God. We've rejected God, and don't blame it on an administration. We've been doing this for a long time. We've been doing it before any Pinocchio got up there in the White House. Don't make me get political. Watch this. Watch this. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. Now watch this. Here's God. He's like, I've given you everything you need to succeed. I've I've blessed you. I've given you finances. I've given you high-powered preachers. Come on, I've given you GQ Ken. And Vogue Barbie, which is not me and my wife, that's not us. I'm G.I. Joe, and that's Jan right there. Maybe Tarzan. On some... <laughs> Help me, somebody. I was going to say Tarzan on, on steroids, more like Tarzan on Twinkies. But I know who I am. Is anybody... Say, I've given you all these things. I've given you cameras. I've given you the power of media. Right now, we can be broadcasting anywhere in the world. And we are in various parts of the world right now. By the power of media. Who did that? God did that. He said, I gave you these things, and I wanted you to succeed. I set you up for success, and you became a person that did what? He said, you sowed wild Grapes. Watch what it says here. Read the Bible with me. I'm not mad at nobody. I'm not picking on anybody. Linus, put your blanket away. Watch this. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth what? Wow, grapes. I don't know about you. Grapes already, sometimes they can be a little bitter, but wild grapes are worse. And God is looking across the nation today. He's looking across the church. He said, man, I wanted you to produce sweet fruit. And what if you're giving me something sour, something that sets the teeth on edge? You all know I'm telling you the truth. You say, well, give me some examples. I don't have time, and you don't have the patience to tolerate me to tell you exactly the wild grapes that are going on in America, especially in the house of God. Will they allow anything to happen, do whatever you want to do, live in any lifestyle you want to live, and then go ahead and make an excuse for it and say God has excused you and that Jesus, his blood paid it all, so just go ahead and do what you want to do, live like you want to live. You can have the Nike Christianity, just do it. Whatever feels good to yourself, just let it flow, let it happen, let it hang, let it flop, do whatever, because it's okay, because God's got your back. I want you to know something, honey doll. There is a payday someday for everybody, and one day we will stand before a mighty God. If you're not washed in the blood and full of the spirit of grace in God, there's going to be a judgment for you. And the Bible said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But we don't fear God no more in America because we got wild grapes. 
Pastor, wild thing standing up before you saying, live like you want to live and do what you want to do and it's going to be all right. I'm here to tell you as a preacher of holiness, you can't live any way you want to live and stand before a holy God. Well, you can do it, but you're not going to stand too long in front of him. Because listen, everybody's going to go to heaven someday, but not everybody gets to stay. Is anybody with me today? You get to go to the great white throne judgment of God. But once your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, swoop, you gone. You gone. Is anybody here? I don't want you to be gone. I want you to stay. God don't want nobody to be gone. He don't want no wild grapes, but he's got them. And let me tell you something about a good farmer. A good farmer don't allow wild things to grow. I'm about to preach this thing up in here. A wild farmer just don't let these weeds do what they want to do. I made the mistake over by my shed to let those devil weeds grow. And once they start, they become a tree. It went from a shrub to a tree. Come on, somebody. I'm going to have to get me some tangerite and blow that stuff up. All my redneck buddies said, yeah, I'm coming over. Some of y'all don't know what tangerite is. You live in the city. Look it up. I can't help you. Can't teach everything tonight. This morning, watch this, verse 3. And now, apocalypse now, now. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. Take this word and make a judgment. Now, this, I'm going to break these glasses. Goodness gracious. I want you to take judgment. I want you to take my word in the vineyard. I want you to take what I have said and what you see. I want you to take what's happening outside here in America and compare it to what the Word said would be in the last days. And you now be the judge. See, Christianity and end-time prophecy is so easy to understand. You just need a six-foot icicle to stand up before you on Sunday morning to muddy the waters and mess it up. Instead of reading the Bible for yourself. See, this Bible was written that a child could understand it. But all you need is some Jack Frost to stand up and mess it up for you, especially the Americanized version. Come on now, of the last days. The Americanized version is that we just live a life of happiness and joy and cars and stuff and wait. Come on, everything that pertains to life, we're just happy. We're floating around. We're little Caspers. And then one day we're gone. We're out of here. We're little sheep. We're out of here. The great shepherd called us to the barn. No, you're going to get sheared before you go. Help me, church. Say, man, he's talking so bad. He, 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 he. Relax. Don't have a panic attack. Let's relax. I'm trying to get folks ready for what's coming. He said, I, I, between me and my vineyard, watch this. Verse 4, what could, what could, what could have been done more to my vineyard than I have done in it? Think about this for a second, church. This is, this is what roused me up, and I haven't even started preaching yet. This is what roused me up. We get all crazy in America about politics and politicians and thinking that they're going to save us. That legislation is going to bring us to righteousness. Uh, you need to tell that to the prisons that are full of prisoners who broke law. They didn't make them righteous. In fact, when they get out, not many are righteous after. Listen to me now. And we think that righteousness can come from government and come from legislation and all these other things. And then we blame everybody in power for what's happening. When the problem with the human heart is the human heart. It's darkened and it needs to be forgiven. It needs to be redeemed. And so watch this now. We have these wild grapes and he says, I want you to judge. I want you to look and I want you to look at my vineyard and say, what more could I have done? What more could God give to America? What more could God give to America? He's given us everything, and we're failing the test. 
We pour money and pour money. We pour money and we pour money into drug addiction. And we pour money into drug wars. And we try to stop it. And we have more and more. We pour money into our inner streets, our outer streets. We still have problems. We pour money into the poor places. We pour money into the rich places. And we still got problems. We pour money into foreign countries and we still at war. We pour money into politicians and they're still crooked. Ah, help me somebody. No matter what side of the fence you're on, they're all messed up. I've told you and I proclaim it again. I am a political atheist. I don't believe in none of them. I don't care what they is. Elephant, donkey, or the back end of both. It don't matter to me. Something ought to help me today. So you don't want real today. You want P- Pastor Fluffy. Oh, just tell me how good I am. No, life is life. It's a reality, baby. And I don't know whether there's any other way to live than raw. Because I don't want you telling me something sugar-coated. You ever gone to a doctor and the doctor lied to you? Well, you have him on the humble so many day. What? You have him on some of the day. What do I got? You're dying. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Is anybody here? And we look to these sources and our preachers, and they don't tell us the truth, and we find ourselves, watch us in a coma, a diabetic coma at that, because we've been sugar-fed all this tripe and trash that when real reality comes and preaching comes to you like this, we don't know what to do, and we're gagging on it. When God don't want you gagging on truth, he wants you to live truth, embrace truth. And he says, I want you to judge. And what more could I have done? I think about these churches. My my wife and I talk about this all the time. We've been around some of the biggest and the baddest and churches, mega churches, worked with some great people, all these different things of our past. But it amazes me of all these multi-millions of dollars that are coming in these churches and they're doing diddly squat. Squat diddly, however you say it, for the kingdom. But they're getting bigger sheep sheds and bigger, come on somebody, big fellowship halls and all these different things and preachers getting a bigger waistline. and Come on now. Dogs and cats got air-conditioned kennels. <laughs> come on, my dog, my, my animals got outside. At least my little kitty does now. Is anybody with me? There's your, there's your AC. And there's your heater. Come on, somebody going to write me? And I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear no Peter head. Verse 4, I'm going back to this. What could have been done more in my vineyard? I've tried everything. I've tried everything with the church. I've tried to get you to repent. i tried to get this nation to come back to me. But we won't listen to God. We got transgenderism like a cancer in our schools today. And I love my teachers. It's absolute insanity that's happening. That's who you need to be praying for, the frontline folk. Praying that God will keep them from strangling people. Come on. My, all my teachers said, Amen. Wherefore, watch this, wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes. He said it again. I believe if God repeats himself, he's got a problem with something. I know when my daddy called my name twice, you better have been there the first time. Second time was way too late. Now you're definitely going to get the whipping. First time you might have had some mercy with pop, but the second time is too late. There's a reason for double initiations. There's a reason for this. Verse 5. And now I go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof. Listen to me. Listen to the prophetic reality and then do a transparent composite, uh, 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 compose it with what's happening today. Watch this. Watch this. And then go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof. Pastor, why are the schools failing? Because the hedge is being taken away. 
Why are we failing in military operations in various parts of the world? Because the hedge is failing. Why are the poor getting poor? Because the hedge is failing. How come we can't find politicians we can trust like the good old days, if there ever was, because the hedge is failing? How come the weather is freaking out, not Al Gore? And global warming, I'm sorry, even though he discovered the Internet. Man, some of y'all catch this later. You, you got to hang in with me. <laughs> you got to have a Wikipedia. And we blame it on global warming. We blame it on the whales. We blame it on cow manure. Bill Gates. We blame it on everything rather than the reality of what hour we're living in according to that Bible that sits in your lap. And we don't want to face it. Then we look to the right and we say it's a Republican's fault. Then we say, no, it's a Democrat's fault. Then we say it's, a, it's the Independent's fault. Then we, we blame it on those who don't know who they are. And it's everybody's fault except the fault of us, the fault of us. We have a faulty heart. We're people of sin. We were born in sin nature. And the only way to fix sin nature is to have a divine nature. The only way to get divine nature is to be born again. And the only way to be born again is to preach the Bible and to preach truth. But we don't want the Bible in the churches no more. We don't want the Bible in our schools anymore. We don't want the Bible in politics. No, no, no. We want the name only. We want the name in order to get the church to vote. And I've said it for years and years and years. You've been duped by them clowns saying, God bless America and kiss some babies and promise you the rainbow. Honey, they can't promise you the rainbow. The only thing they can promise you is the rain. Jesus is the one that promises life, an everlasting life. Watch what he says here. He brought forth wild grapes. I want you to go to that vineyard. I want you to tell them, I'm going to take this hedge down and break down the wall thereof. I've preached so many times for so many years about the breaches that are taking place in America. You're worried about a wall being built over on the border and all the other controls that we have. We can't even control our inner cities. We can't even control our folks. We can't even control our law enforcement. We can't even control certain things in our own society. Come on now that deal with the heart of humanity. And we're in deep, deep trouble. And this fracture goes deep into the heart of humanity. And this is exactly what Jesus said would be the condition of our day. But somehow Puff the Magic Dragon preacher gets up on Sunday morning and he blows out some type of magical dust that everybody goes, wow, this is not really happening. Everybody's on shrooms. And you think I'm kidding you. You know I've already preached on churches that smoke dope and do shrooms. They got a revelation. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I could do this all day long. If I wasn't for time constraints for radio, I would do it all day. Just preach, preach, preach. See, anybody, with, because we're in a stupor. We're in that diabetic coma, by the way. I'm not making fun of anybody who has that situation. But you know how it is, that glazed donut look. Kind of like you all give me around 12. Oh, very close to that. The eyes flutter back. And, uh, and he ever, is he ever going to shut up? No. I just got to start. We only in verse 6. And he said he shall be eaten up. Watch us break down the walls thereof and shall be trodden down. Why are we trodden down? Because we left God. Why are they freaking out in Atlanta right now? Because... We've left God. Why'd they kill 10 folks in a mass murder over in L.A.? Because we've left God. How come we're seeing over in, in Kennison, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, or, or Philadelphia, how come we're seeing zombie land where people are running around with a new drug called Fang that is mixed together with trans, uh, tranquilizers and f fentanyl 
It's the newest. Go watch the video. If you got the stomach, no, church, I would do it. No, don't show that to me, Pastor. It's amazing to me. Church folk don't want to hear certain things, but they go home and watch it. How dare he? You know I'm telling you the truth. But then the church will get fake. Come on now. We go in our glove department. As soon as we pull in, we open up that glove department. We pull out the fake church face. The permagrin. How you doing? Good. Come on now. The preacher's the same thing. Pastor permagrin. Everything. Hey, it's great. Oh, whoo. And you know why they do that? Because they want your money. Come on now. I'm not worried about your money because God pays the bills, not you. I appreciate you what you do and all those things. Don't get nervous. We're not taking up another offering, but I'm not worried. That's why I can preach the way I preach because I'm not afraid of you. 100%. Is anybody here? I would rather say, I'm going to stand before a mighty God someday. And he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? I gave you this vineyard, boy. What did you do with it? Well, Lord, I preached. I, I stepped on the wild grapes. Don't look at your neighbor, but you look wild today. I'm trying to stay focused here. And then he said, it shall be trod down. You wonder why. Go, go, go look at those videos. Go see what's happening. They're calling it zombie land. They're spinning around in circles. And they're falling down. And it's happening right. They're no longer shooting up in an alley somewhere. They're shooting up right there in front of everybody. Because there's no more shame in America. There's no more shame. Love Philadelphia. Love our brothers and sisters from Philadelphia. Love those folks in San Francisco. But that place is going to hell in the handbasket. Not only, not only there, but around America. And you can pump all the money you want in there, and you can vote somebody in there and say, we're going to make a change. They're not going to make a change. They're going to change your old, your old change for money, for a dollar. They're going to they take from you. You understand? It's apocalypse now. We live in, in tribulation times now, not theologically the end times as far as the finishing of it all, but we in the beginning of sorrows. And the church of Jesus Christ is needed now like never before. My God, I wish we had some special forces. I wish we had some black ops. I wish we had some Christians that had a backbone that are willing to go into the enemy held front lines and quit hiding behind a skirt and quit hiding behind a preacher. Listen, you live in hell, you might as well fight hell. I don't know, I'm going to pull every hair I got left of my head out. I don't understand, folks. You're already going to walk out of this building and live in hell. You might as well fight hell. That's why I like people like Firefighter Mike over there, because Mike knows what's going, like, what it's like to go into a fire. When everybody's running from a fire, he's going in it. I know, been there, done it, did my time. And I'm still the same today. I'm not worried. Oh, don't you know the community's getting bad? So? Don't you know it's getting worse and, and there's, there's all kinds of darkness happening? So? Go into it. Go you where? Into all the world. Not just some of the world. Not just the white folk world or the black folk world or the zebra folk world. Go into all the world. Ah, you ain't listening to me. Watch this. While well, you think about lunch, <clears throat> verse six, and I will lay it to a beautiful pasture with lilies and l lucky charms and butterfly kisses. I will lay it to waste. What you think's happening in America? Waste. Again, I love my teachers, but they know they living in a they working in a cesspool. They contact me. They tell me. From highly educated to teachers, the teachers that are, you know, just doing whatever they do in the schools, they, they, they tell me. It's horrible. And you don't need a teacher to tell you. All you got to do is read 
articles. How does a six-year-old shoot a teacher? What's next? Drive a tank through the school? I don't know what else is next, but it's coming. And your prophecy teacher's telling you we ain't going to see bad times. Where are they? They done checked out in their brains. Listen, I'm not trying to get in an argue with anybody. I don't argue the word. I just tell it like it is. You judge. Is anybody with me today? How does a child do it? And then I, I read some of these reports that says uh, uh, the six-year-old child allegedly shot. Now, I'm not very educated. Though I have several degrees, doesn't mean I'm very smart. Thank you for that amen. And... But when I say allegedly, it means, if I, it's probably the same down there in Louisiana, it means it might not have happened. Or it could have happened. Though the ladies in the hospital shot. So whether the mom came in and dad came in and shot for the child, or the child shot the teacher. Is, any, is anybody seeing the same things I'm seeing? And it is absolute insanity. You say, Pastor, well, that's just the times we're living. Thank you very much. You got it, scholar. So what does the church do? The church doesn't just talk about it and then cry about it and say, oh, man, the world's so terrible. Come, Lord, take me out of here. No, the world says, I understand it and I see it. And I'm going to work harder than I ever before, did before to try to stop the next six-year-old from doing it. I'm going to do whatever I can to witness to somebody. I'm going to pray. I'm going to preach. I'm going to intercede. I'm going to do everything I'm going to need to do. But no, the American church, watch this, we believe our solution is voting we believe we're going to vote it in you can't vote it in and you can't vote it out it's called sin now i won't be able to change the total the totality of the landscape of america by my preaching but i can change somebody i can change one family and so could you I don't have any of this, this utopia dream thinking that we're going to be all holding hands and singing kumbaya, my Lord, while the world goes to hell in a handbasket. I recognize I will be right there at the front lines fighting the good fight of faith. That's what this church is doing. I said, that's what this church is doing. That's what you're doing. Those that are watching and listening right now, that's a part of this house. Come on, I got six chapters to go through. Watch this. And I will lay it. I will lay it to waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged. He said, I ain't even going to try to fix it. Oh, will somebody help me? I'm not even going to try to fix it. I'm not even going to try to waste no money on it. Ah, I feel good today. Because it makes such easy theology for me. I get this. I don't know why you don't. Some folks in the church. I don't know why they don't get it. I don't know why some of you big shots watching right now. I don't know why they don't get it. I'm not going to fix it. I'm going to let the wheat and the tear grow together. I'm going to let the whole thing come together. And then at that day, I will judge it all. The sheep and the goat. See, you're trying to fix things. I'm not trying to fix stuff. I'm trying to fix people. I'm trying to work on them and help them and feed the hungry and clothe the naked and do whatever I can for those that are in distress and disaster. And bringing forth gospel truth and hope, that's my job. That's your job. But I ain't going to fix nothing. How many times do you hear a politician say, you send me there, I'll fix that place up there. Ah. We're going to drain the swamp. Mm -hmm. You are the swamp. You can't drain something you are. The devil can't cast out the devil. I said, the devil can't cast out the devil. But we go, here we come, 24. Chicka, 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 chicka. The train of change is coming, folks. Cuckoo. You've lost your brains. You've lost your sanctified head. Because you don't read the Bible. You listen to politicians. You listen to preachers who are paid advertisers. I'm going to break this microphone. I'm telling you the truth. These big shots of the uh, parading around with politicians are getting paid to do it. 
maybe not in a check, but they're getting promotions, they're getting photo shots and shoots and all these different things, and they're getting opportunities to hang with the big dogs. Hey, the only thing I know about a bigger dog, the smellier they are, the more fleas they have. <laughs> Though I like big dogs, by the way. Come on, I'm going to get somebody mad if I mention chihuahuas. Watch this. Flo, I ain't talking about your two-inch, what's that, two-inch, two-ounce dog you got? That ain't no dog, but anyways. It's a cutie pie, it's a cutie pie. Watch it. And I will lay it to waste. It shall not be, shall not be pruned nor dug. Don't be dig. Watch this. But there shall come up briars and thorns. I'm going to let it happen. Oh, I, I just, I don't, I don't, I can't, I need time. I don't understand why it's happened in my community. The Lord allows it. I'm just telling you the way it is. And I, this will really help your theology. It really help you down the long haul as long as we have on this earth. He's going to allow it to happen. How many times you've gone to a community and saw them pick up the road mess and about a week later it's trashed again? This road is picked up by such and such Kiwanis Club. And it's right back to what it was. Listen, again, it's not about trying to, to be a blessing to people. It's just having this misnomer and this level of insanity to think I'm going to change people by good works or I'm going to change people by trying to do the right thing and everything's going to be copacetic and all this is going to go away. It's just going to sweep it all underneath the carpet. That's where the church is today. We don't realize what time it is because our preachers won't tell you what time it is. Here we go, here we go, here we go. I'm trying to move on. I'm trying to get out of this gear. I'm stuck in granny gear. Watch this. And I will also command the clouds that should no rain come upon it. I don't understand why the churches are so dry. I don't understand the Spirit of God ain't moving. Got 10,000 people, but God ain't doing nothing. They're running around shouting. Got light machines and smoke machines and all these other things. People dropping their weaves off and wigs are flying off and Two pays are hanging on the ceiling, the chandeliers, and but God ain't there because you rejected God. Verse seven: For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Here he explains it. Don't you like to be explained to? I thank God he explains it for people like me. For the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. Got it. And the men of Judah is a pleasant plant. Got that, sir? And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness. He said, I was looking for blessings to come. Watch this. But you oppress the poor. You oppress the poor. Now, we can talk about this in America, and while the richer get richer, the poor get poor. But we can also flip that over to the church. The church is getting richer, and the poor outside are getting poorer. Because the church won't lend a hand. I'm feeling good. They don't want to help out because it's all about Pastor Big Bucks and Big Britches. It's all about him and his ministry and stuff and all oh, the lights and cameras. All this big glamorous stuff. Instead of going and reaching the poor and helping those that have a, a handout. You know I'm telling you the truth. So many times we fly over the mission field, which is America, to get to a so-called mission field. This is our mission field as well. Thank God for what we're doing around the world. Doing a lot of things, doing a lot of good, and we're going to do a lot more this year. Watch and see by the grace of God. But we're going to do more in our community. This is what he's saying to them. You, you, you oppress the poor. Watch this. Behold, but behold a cry. Does anybody hear the cry? Woe unto them that join. Uh, I, need, I need a day of this. Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. Do you know what he's talking about? Covetousness. He's talking about false prosperity. He said, you guys put yourself and stuff together. You add and you add and you add and you add, and then you drive out the poor with your prosperity. 
That's exactly what these guys do, these charlatans, witches, and, and warlocks in these ministries when all they want is your money and they drive out the poor. Only the rich can hang out in this church, the country club church. Only the fancy ones, only the ones that drive newer vehicles. You know I'm telling you the truth. And they exclude the poor and they build upon themselves more, more, more till there's no room at all. Let me ask you something. When somebody comes in to develop an area, what are the two things that are chased out? You ready? Wildlife and folks. Poor folk. And they buy their stuff at bottom dollar. Just ask casino folks. I'm, I'm, I'm stepping on something today. And it stinks. It stinks. It's the truth. And then the lower purple person thinks they got a jackpot when the person that knows what they know got more than that. They got the whole bank. And this is what he's saying. You drive out these people. Believe me, I've been in ministries and I've been around folks. You've been around churches that if you, did, you weren't upper class, you didn't sit up front. Y'all forgot. Y'all forgot. Y'all need to go back to some churches. Just go visit. Just go back and visit some of them places. You didn't have the right size hat. Come on now. You didn't look right, wrong color. Had the wrong accent. You didn't get first row. You didn't get front seat. You didn't get first opportunity. But look what he's saying here. And this, again, is speaking to the, to the nation, is speaking to the church. Mine ears, in mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth, many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath. Which, watch this now. I'm going to give you the whole illustration. It means nine gallons. And the seed of a homer shall yield one eth, which is, watch this, 10% of what was produced. Here's what he was saying. He's saying, you're going to have 10 acres, and you're only going to get nine gallons. That ain't a good return. In other words, he's prophesying and telling them there's going to be a shallow return on your harvest. That's why we have churches that look so big, but they're so shallow. Looks like they're so big ministries and flying in airplanes and doing all these different things, but spiritually they're shallow, and so are their folks. Also showing that there will be an economic disaster, an economic downturn to where you sow all that you sowed and all you get is 10%. When you should be giving 10% to God, you'll get the 90 back. Too much to preach. I'm running out of time now to tell you the whole story. But what he's showing us is a reversal. Rejection brings reversal. The rejection of God brings reversal. I can sum it up right there. Watch this. Let's go on. I got to go. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that follow strong drink. Don't drink. Oh, I got one that said, thank you. Appreciate that. Come on now. That follow strong drink that they might, what, continue until the night. What does that sound like? America. Party! Americans don't need a holiday. All they need is a game. Whether it's sports or a game show. Come on now, we party. And I'm not castigating anybody. I know what I did before before I was saved. I partied like it was 1999, 98, 97, 96, 95. Come on. <laughs> I never wanted the party to stop. Never. Now, see, this is where you all hiding behind your, your horns. You know it's the truth. We have a party in spirit in America. We love the party. It's the same thing in the church. Come on now. It used to be, it used to be where people would preach righteousness and stay away from strong drink. Here's my opinion on it all. Why do you need it? Here's my opinion on it all. Besides the word saying it, why would I want to go back to the vomit I used to live in? Well, pastor, don't you know the Bible says? Yeah, the Bible says a lot of stuff. And the Bible omits a lot of stuff. Because the Bible wants you to live by faith and live by conscience, not by rules and regulations. But why would I want to go back to the mire? Why would I take my liberty in Christ and make my brother stumble? 
That's a whole message I don't have time to preach on. Paul said all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. See? But no, I'm, I'm saved. I can do what I want to do. No, I want to live right. I want to be like a Nazarene. I just want to say, Lord, I love you. I'm keeping myself clean. I'm doing everything I can, Lord. I don't want anything to mess up my focus. I don't need alcohol. I don't need tobacco. That's tobacco if you don't know what it is. I don't need none of that. I don't need uppers and I don't need downers. Come on now. Again, it's too late in the message to try to preach on that. But we have more narcotic dealers in the church and users in the house of God than we do down below the underpass or overpass or wherever you're living. Watch this. Gosh, I got to go, man. They strong drink till the night till wine inflames them. Yeah, we got a bunch of inflamed people and the harp and the vial and the tabret and the pipe and the the wine and the bass and the thumping and the guitar and are in, oh, banjo, don't forget the banjo for my brothers, are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord. I got to go. I got to go. We want to party. And forget about everything. Forget about everything that's happening. Come on, pastor, let's, have another, let's, let's eat some more. Let's have another fellowship dinner. Come on, let's just get together. Let's just, let's just party. Let's just forget it, man. This is the... And then forget the work of the Lord. You see, life and the world will pollute you from your focus of what God has called you to do. I'm not telling you not to live and love life. I live life. I love life. I try to live it to the fullest. Abby and I are thinking about parachuting out of a plane. When I push her, I'll see her when I land. Every time she sees something extreme sports, she's like, I want to do that. I'm like, sign here. Come on, somebody. I want to live life. I love what God has given us. I'm so grateful. But I can't allow those luxuries and those things that God has given me and given you to blind us. We can't look at what God has given us here at Ignited and what is ours is, 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 is small compared to others, but it's ours. And we can't let that blind us and say, no, it's all about us. No, it's about the king and the kingdom. And the strategy that's before us. I'm out of time. And I am pouting inside. You don't know how much I'm pouting because I would love to preach this thing for the rest of this day. But you won't have to be a Berean and go study it yourself. Everybody watching me, you're going to have to go read this and finish Isaiah chapter 5. Seriously, make it your homework. Pray about it and say, God, I see. I see the, the comparison between Israel and where we are today. And you will see that God is allowing these things. And you haven't even, we haven't even walked into judgment yet of what God is going to allow on this earth. But I want you to be sober. Don't be drunk with the world, man. Be sober and realize these are sovereign times of God. These are dangerous times. And that God has called us not for us to be fearful, but to be faithful and go to the front lines and reach the world. Whatever it takes. If you're watching me right now and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today's the day to make it right. I know there's a lot of things that are said that you may not understand, but that's okay. It's easy as this. Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. All you have to do is accept him, receive him in your heart. The Bible declares, watch this, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. If you die today, you're guaranteed to be in heaven with him. That's what the Bible says. And we believe that by faith. If you're backslidden, man, this has hit you, and you're part of those wild grapes, it's time to get it right. Yep, you can make that bitter turn back to sweet, but you got to go to sweetness. you got to go to Jesus. He'll make that happen. Father, we love you. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Help us to have an awesome day. Bless all of our visitors, those that are going to be traveling, those that are watching right now. We love you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, I'll see you Wednesday night. Be blessed.